We had a study, very interesting, is that uh, we give a uh, medication that is very, very similar to cocaine. is a medical medication uh, called methylphenidate. And that is in uh, not a, pres a prescription drug. It's in the IV form of that um, uh, retinin. And uh, we give uh, a group of cocaine abuser and intravenously and we found that uh, a majority of the cocaine abuser, they like it. The reason they take the cocaine because of they have ADHD. So they use the cocaine to, to treat themselves. And uh, this group of people, the moment they use the cocaine, they feel much better. And so after we found this, and we, we asked them to see um, the psychiatrist and to treat their ADHD, turned out they never use cocaine anymore. In fact, the chemical action of these medications is very similar and sometimes identical to that of amphetamines. In the 1930s, amphetamines were sold over the counter in the form of inhalers for asthma as a stimulant or to suppress hunger. It was widely used by athletes, truckers, politicians, and soldiers. Cave by cave and one by one. It could even be said that World War II was waged under the influence of amphetamines. The German, American, and English armies gave out amphetamine rations to their soldiers to combat fatigue. Inflicted heavy damage on American naval forces off Okinawa. This was kamikaze. It was sensational, but it could never... Stop. The obliviousness of the Japanese kamikazes can partially be explained by their huge consumption of amphetamines. After Japan was defeated, the remaining stocks were sold to the public and amphetamine addiction became a major problem in post-war Japan. In the 60s, amphetamines came to be known as speed and were very popular among young people. The Who would sing My Generation on amphetamines and break their instruments at the end of their concerts. In the 80s, amphetamines were made illegal. But 26 million people all over the world, including 3 million Japanese, continued to take them. Unlike regular amphetamines, drugs prescribed for children like Ritalin are slower acting and longer lasting. As a result, there is no euphoric rush and concentration is improved. Questions have arisen, however, concerning the consequences of giving stimulants to children. Some people think it could make them more prone to drug abuse later on. So there's been a lot of investigation about whether children at this sort of vulnerable age of brain development, given a stimulant as a medication, are sensitizing the brain mechanisms that underlie addiction. And I would say the data there are equivocal. There have been one or two studies which suggest there's an increased prevalence of, of, of vulnerability at least to addiction in individuals with, who've been treated with Ritalin because of their ADHD. Other studies which have shown not. So I, I think it's not an easy story to, to tell, an easy explanation to give. We'll ever love you we I can love you Governments all over the world have launched a flurry of cocaine prevention campaigns. And the truth is, they have had very little effect. For scientists, addiction is not a choice. 
pero si no se irá. Quiero que vengas conmigo al Valle Gabriel. No one can keep the earth gone wrong. Nobody, nobody love you the way that I could. Cause nobody, nobody that strong. Initially, there is a choice, and I put like that choice because addiction starts really during adolescence and sometimes during childhood. And when kids are exposed to drugs, they are exposed into the context of their group peers with the pressures. And so many times they choose, not because they really want to take the drug, but because they want to be part of a group, which is a normal neurobiological response of being an adolescent. You want to be cool, you want to be liked by your peers, very much driven by group interactions. But say they choose to take the drug within all of those caveats. Then some of them will take the drug and will take the drug, will outgrow it, that's the end. Some will become addicted. They chose to take the drug. They did not choose to become addicted. Just like a person that smokes a cigarette. They choose to, cigar to, to smoke the cigarette. They do not choose to develop lung cancer. Exactly the same process. We don't know. It is estimated in animals and humans that approximately 20 to 30 percent of people that take drugs have the vulnerability of becoming addicted and will become addicted. Mm -hmm. Drug addiction, a true brain disease? Do willpower and self-control depend entirely on the brain's internal equilibrium and well-being? One of the most valued qualities of human behavior is that of voluntary control. After all, if we think of, think of the value of freedom, which we very much, um, I mean, people fight for freedom, is one of the things that's so important. It connotes freedom has no sense if there's no voluntary control. Well, as I was telling you, in order for you to be able to exert voluntary control, there are certain areas of the brain that need to function properly. So if those areas are not functioning properly, then is it voluntary control? I will start to understand this. Then such very fundamental questions as what constitutes voluntary behavior become evident. And, and one of the diseases where they are most evident is in drug addiction. Because I, I can tell you, I've, uh, for many, many years, I've been interacting with the drug addicted people. And, and it's actually drug addicted people, women, for example, they lose their children because of taking a drug. They are put in probation and they say, if you take a drug, we'll take your children. And they love their children. They don't want to lose their children. And then for whatever reasons, they are found themselves with a friend. They are exposed to the drug. And before they see it, they are taking the drug, even at the expense of losing their children. And it's not that they don't love their children. They could not control it. It's all, almost like their, voluntary, their control has been removed. We have control. So he says, well, how couldn't they do it? Are human beings nothing more than slaves to their neurons? Are our decisions the fruit of reasoning or products of the huge pharmacy that is our brain? And what happens to free will in all of this? We would think there's free will, and there is the assumption that there's free will, otherwise we will have terrible problems to run a government or run a state or run a, a civilization. But how far that free will goes and how much it is influenced by the unconscious, for example, and by rewards that act on the unconscious, we don't know. I, I don't know. That's a very complicated issue, and I think if you ask for a major research question, maybe you have one here, the free will issue, maybe more than the consciousness issue, because that determines the way society works and how it's run by the individual brains. Struggling against their drives and impulses, agitated by the internal pharmacies, are human beings merely the playthings of the concoctions in their brains? Our brain, we now know, is a delicate balance of chemicals capable of influencing our behavior and, in particular, our attitude with regard to drugs. The source of mental disorders may be traced to disturbances in brain chemistry, 
Antidepressants correct imbalances that are perfectly observable in the brains of depressed patients. The work being done by scientists compels society to change its perception and treat depression and drug addiction as the illnesses that they are.